Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, and welcome to lesson number 12 in the Sabbath School lesson series on the Gospel of John. It's titled, The Hour of Glory, the Cross and Resurrection, and is ready for teaching on December 21. And your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, December 14. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're almost at the end of this book of John, this gospel that tells us about the life of Jesus, and this week we approach his death. We pray that as we open your word, that not only will we just see this story, the story of your grace and your love and the salvation that is provided through the death of Jesus, but also we may see for ourselves the worth of what it was that Jesus did for us and accept that worth and be blessed as a result, not only for ourselves, but for our families and those we associate with. And today I'd particularly like to pray for Teresa in Sherman in Texas and Jack Fruitgall from Fort Lauderdale in Florida and Farouk Muhammad. I don't know where he lives, Lord, but he's requested prayer and Jennifer Robinson and her grandchildren and Donald Coote has asked for prayer, Lord, and Lorna Martin, a kindergarten teacher at New Bethel Seventh-day Adventist Academy in Antigua. Lord, she's asked for prayer for her school, and I pray not only for the school, but for her and the rest of the staff and the children there too. Now, as we open your word, may we find that as we look at the death of Jesus and the things that happened before, that we may be just so grateful and that we may give our hearts to him. We pray in his dear name. Amen. Now, memory text this week is John chapter 18 and verse 37. Then Pilate said to him, So, you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Let's read that again, John 18, verse 37. Then Pilate said to him, So, you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection are the climax of John. The first ten chapters cover roughly three and a half years. Chapters 11 to 20, in contrast, cover about one to two weeks. The four Gospels present the death of Jesus in different ways. Though their accounts are compatible, each author emphasizes key points that especially resonate with the themes of his Gospel. Matthew emphasizes the fulfillment of Scripture. Mark emphasizes the parallel between the baptism of Jesus and the cross. And Luke focuses on the cross as healing and salvation, the story of the thief on the cross. But John presents the cross as the enthronement of Jesus, particularly tied to the idea of the hour, which is referred to numerous times throughout the book. We'll just look at three right now. First of all, John 7, verse 30. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And John 8, verse 20. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. And John 12, 27. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. This idea of enthronement is an ironic picture, since crucifixion was the most ignominious and shameful way to die that the Romans used. This contrast points to the deeply ironic depiction that John presents. Jesus is dying in shame, but it is, at the same time, his glorious enthronement as the Saviour. (music) 
Sunday, December 15. What is truth? In John 18, verses 28 to 32, the trial of Jesus is not described in detail. The focus is on Jesus brought before Pontius Pilate. Read John chapter 18, verses 33 to 38. What did Pilate and Jesus talk about? Let's begin at John 18 and verse 33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked, Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. The governor asked Jesus if he is the king of the Jews. In John 18 verse 33, it is the first reference to this title but will not be the last. Jesus asked Pilate if he is asking this on his own or did others say that he was? His question turns the tables on the governor, querying if he understands to whom he is speaking. The reader already knows that Jesus is the king. Will the governor? Pilate responds with his own query. Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? In verse 35. It was an evasion rooted in irritation at the close application of Jesus' question. It was the governor's first step away from the truth, letting prejudice block his perception. Jesus responds that his kingdom is not of this world in verse 36. Pilate then perceptively deduces that Jesus does claim to be a king in verse 37. This leads to Jesus' important explanation that He was born to bear witness to the truth and that every person who is of the truth hears his voice in verse 37. Pilate then asks in verse 38, What is truth? But he doesn't wait for the answer. Instead, he goes outside to try to save Jesus from the crowd. Truth is a theme in John's Gospel as the eternal word or logos in chapter 1 verses 1 to 5 which read, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the light and the truth. All this is in contrast to darkness and error. He is full of grace and truth, as we read in John 1.14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth come through him. We read in verse 17 of chapter 1, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John the Baptist bore witness to the truth. We read in John 5.33, You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Jesus affirmed that his Father is true in John 7.38, Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him. Jesus himself heard the truth 
from his father in John 8 verse 40. As it is, you were looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life we find in John 14 verse 6. It reads, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The word of God is truth. We read in John 17, verse 17. Despite his question, Pilate missed his opportunity to know the truth because of his prejudice, his earlier decisions and the pressures upon him. And so to finish the day, a simple question. How do you understand the idea of Jesus as the truth? Monday, December 16, Behold the Man. Read John 18, verses 38, right through to chapter 19, verse 5. How did Pilate try to persuade the people to ask for Jesus' release? John 18, beginning at verse 38. What is truth? reported Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. Pilate did not wait for an answer from Jesus concerning truth. Instead, he went back out to try to persuade the people. By dialoguing with them, instead of just letting Jesus go free, Pilate placed himself at a disadvantage. The religious leaders recognized that they could manipulate the governor through the crowd. Pilate refers to a custom of letting a prisoner go free at the time of the Passover, and asks if the people want him to release the king of the Jews. Surprisingly, and quite ironically, the people ask for the release of a brigand named Barabbas, rather than the innocent Jesus. Now begins the mockery and shaming of Jesus. The Roman soldiers plait a crown of thorns, put a purple robe on him, and keep coming up and mockingly hailing him as king of the Jews. This type of greeting by soldiers would be similar to the way they greeted the emperor, but here it was done in mockery. By playing on the pity of the people, Pilate seems to be seeking some way to release Jesus. He brings Jesus out wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe. The scene, uncommented on by John, displays Jesus in mock kingly garb, with the governor calling on the people to... Behold the man, in John 19, verse 5. This reminds the reader of John the Baptist's words in John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. It is ironic that the pagan governor presents the Messiah in this kingly attire before Israel. However, as John 19, verses 6 to 16 shows... The mob calls for Jesus' crucifixion based on his claim to be the Son of God. This frightens Pilate, who seeks all the more to arrange Jesus' release. But the leaders seal Jesus' fate by claiming that to release him is to oppose Caesar. They know that Pilate's loyalty to Caesar would mean he could not release someone claiming the same role. Let's read John 19, verses 6 to 16. 
As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. The leaders say they have no king but Caesar. Thus their deep hatred of Jesus was greater than their national aspirations. To rid themselves of this Jesus, they were willing to sacrifice claims to national autonomy. And so to finish the day, how scary a pagan ruler wants to release Jesus while the spiritual leaders of the nation who should have recognised him wanted him crucified instead. What lessons can we take from this for ourselves? Tuesday, December 17, it is finished. As John 19, 17-22 shows, Pilate wrote an inscription in Latin, Greek and Hebrew that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Well, let's read that passage, John 19, beginning at verse 17. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. The religious leaders wanted it changed. Pilate would have none of it, and the inscription remained, a mute witness to the truth about Jesus and one of the markers that Jesus is enthroned on the cross as the King. Here was Jesus, truly their King, the King of the Jews, hanging on a cross like a common criminal. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 745, A higher power than Pilate or the Jews had directed the placing of that inscription above the head of Jesus. In the providence of God, it was to awaken thought and investigation of the Scriptures. Read John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. What touching scene regarding Jesus' mother happened at the cross? John 19, beginning at verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, 
his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Among those standing at the foot of the cross that day were John, the beloved disciple, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and others. Many years before, Simeon had predicted this very experience when Joseph and Mary brought Jesus to the temple to dedicate him. And we look now at Luke chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Now, in his dying moments, Jesus speaks to his mother. Woman, behold your son. To John, he says, Behold your mother. Read John 19, verses 28 to 30. What is the significance of Jesus' dying words? It is finished. John 19, beginning at verse 28. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that Scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The Greek verb teleo, to finish, complete, carry out in John 19.28, all was now finished, as it says in the ESV, is the same verb as used in verse 30. It is finished. Furthermore, a related word, to liu, to finish, made perfect, also appears in verse 28 in reference to the fulfilment of the scripture, to fulfill the scripture. However horrific the scene, Everything was being fulfilled, accomplished, and completed. When Jesus says, It is finished, he is completing, fulfilling the work that the Father gave him to do. And so, to finish today, when Jesus said, It is finished, what does that mean for each of us? What was finished? And how does that apply to our lives? Wednesday, December 18. The Empty Tomb. Read John chapter 20, verses 1 to 7. What is the importance to us about what is depicted in these verses? John 20, beginning at verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So, She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Jesus died late on Friday afternoon and rose again on Sunday. Because the Sabbath was near when he was buried, in John 19, verse 42, we read that, the burial process was done hastily and not completely. Let's just check John 19, 42. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. However much they loved Jesus, 
his followers kept the Sabbath day and did not go to the tomb. We compare this with Mark 16 verse 1, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. And Luke 23 verse 56, Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. After the Sabbath, a number of women brought spices to the tomb on Sunday morning. To their shock, the stone was rolled away, and the tomb was empty. Mary Magdalene was one of those who came early to the tomb. She ran to tell Peter and John what she saw. The two men ran there. John outran Peter and arrived first. Stooping down, he looked inside and saw the linen cloths with which Jesus had been wrapped. But he did not go in. Peter, however, went inside and saw the linen cloths lying there. He saw, too, the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head, but it was not with the rest of the cloths. It was folded up and sitting apart. Read John 20, verses 8 to 10. What was the meaning of the folded face cloth? John 20, beginning at verse 8. Finally, the other disciples, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. After Peter entered the tomb, John also entered. John 20 verse 8 says that he went in, saw, and believed. Why would seeing the grave clothes lying there and the face cloth lying separately folded up lead John to believe Jesus had risen from the dead? To answer this question, it is necessary to ponder why the tomb would be empty in the first place. The most typical answer would be grave robbers, but this explanation fails for three reasons. First, Matthew tells us that the tomb was guarded, making grave robbery unlikely. Let's read Matthew 27 verses 62 to 66. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Second, grave robbers typically steal valuables, not rotting bodies. Third, grave robbers are in a hurry and do not fold up grave cloths. No wonder, then, that when John saw the face cloth folded, he believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. Thursday, December 19, Jesus and Mary Read John chapter 20, verses 11 to 13. What happened here that shows why Mary Magdalene still did not understand the meaning of the empty tomb? John 20, beginning at verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken... My Lord, away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. The last reference to Mary in the text before this one is her telling Peter and John about the empty tomb. In John 20, verse 2, So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. They ran to the tomb, and she came back there a little later. 
After Peter and John inspected the tomb, they left it. But Mary returned and, weeping, lingered there. No doubt she had done a great deal of crying during the last few days, and now this as well. Stooping over, she looked inside. To her surprise, two angels in white were in the tomb, sitting where Jesus' body had lain. They asked her, Woman, why are you weeping? That's John 20, verse 13. Her pained reply was that they had taken away her Lord, and she did not know where they had laid him. Read John 20, verses 14 to 18. What changed everything for Mary? John 20, beginning at verse 14. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Through tear-dimmed eyes, Mary turned and saw someone standing behind her. In words similar to those of the angels, the stranger asks, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? In verse 15. She thinks she is talking to the gardener and asks for his help in finding the body of Jesus. The stranger says one word, Mary. It was a one-word revelation that changed the world. Suddenly, the surprised Mary recognises that the risen Jesus is talking to her and acknowledges him. Jesus insists that she not detain him as he must ascend to his father. But her task is to go and tell the disciples that he is ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. In verse 17, Mary fulfilled her mission. She told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and also told all the other details he had shared with her. We read in verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. And so to finish today, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 20. According to Paul, what good is our Christian faith if Christ had not been raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, We are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. Friday, December 20, Further Thought Pilate longed to deliver Jesus, but he saw that he could not do this and yet retain his own position and honour. Rather than lose his worldly power, he chose to sacrifice an innocent life. How many, to escape loss or suffering, in like manner sacrifice principle? Conscience and duty point one way, and self-interest points another. 
The current sets strongly in the wrong direction, and he who compromises with evil is swept away into the thick darkness of guilt. End of quote. And then from the same book, page 758, Christ did not yield up his life till he had accomplished the work which he came to do, and with his parting breath he exclaimed, It is finished. John 19, verse 30. The battle had been won. His right hand and his holy arm had gotten him the victory. As a conqueror, he planted his banner on the eternal heights. Was there not joy among the angels? All heaven triumphed in the Saviour's victory. Satan was defeated and knew that his kingdom was lost. And to the angels and the fallen worlds, the cry, It is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. They, with us, share the fruits of Christ's victory. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. What decision-making processes can help you avoid making the kind of mistake that Pilate made? 2. Why did Jesus have to die in our place? Why did he have to be our substitute? Why was his death necessary if we were to have salvation? What scripture passages support your answer? 3. What is the relationship between scriptural evidence and historical evidence when it comes to belief in Jesus' resurrection? That is, what is the historical evidence that powerfully confirms Jesus' resurrection? And question 4. Think about 1 Corinthians fifteen twelve to 20 which we've just read. How does one make sense of the idea that, without Christ's resurrection, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, as it says in verse 18, if those who have fallen asleep in Christ immediately go to heaven? How do Paul's words here confirm the truth that the dead sleep until the resurrection at Christ's return? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Kingston Finds Hope by Andrew McChesney A Bible worker invited several people to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Bethel, Alaska to share their life stories with a visitor from Adventist Mission. Part of the 13th Sabbath offering for fourth quarter 2024 will go to repair and expand the church so it can accommodate a centre of influence for ministry in Bethel. I had flown to the town of 6,300 people to collect mission stories to promote the project, but no one showed up at the church at the designated time. The Bible worker, Joy Anderson, waved toward a large pizza that she had picked up on her way to the church from her office, where she works as a lawyer. Help yourself, said Joy, who is originally from Alabama and co-leads the church with another Bible worker. I had hoped that pizza would encourage people to come. About half the pizza was gone when Kingston walked in. He expressed surprise that he was the only person present. Then he took a slice of pizza, sat down, and spoke about why he worships at the Adventist Church. The 59-year-old custodian said he struggled for years with alcohol and drugs in Hooper Bay, a Yukon Kush Okwin Delta town of 1,400 people located 90 minutes by small plane from Bethel. I wanted to get out of the crummy life that I was living, he said. I told myself, if I do not learn from this lesson, if I do not learn from my mistakes, people would think that I am dumb. Then Kingston moved to Bethel, following the path of many Yukon Cushcoquin Delta residents who have left small towns in hope of better lives in Bethel, the largest community in western Alaska. Yukon Kush Okwin Delta's population is about 85% Alaska natives, who are primarily Yupik or Kupik and Athabascan. One day, Steve, an Adventist and Yukon Kush Okwin Delta native, invited Kingston to the Bethel Church. He asked me if I was troubled or down, Kingston said. I was curious where he was going, so I started coming. 
Kingston found strength in spending time with other churchgoers who had overcome their dependence on alcohol and drugs. They helped me to stay away from those things, he said. This setting has helped me. He said he is happy but still seeking answers. The good man up above sees everything, he said. We all find our answers somehow. Please pray for Kingston, who attends church nearly every Sabbath, but has yet to make a decision for baptism. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering that will support the Bethel Seventh-day Adventist Church's mission outreach this quarter. The names of Bethel residents have been changed to protect their privacy. But the photo depicts Joy Anderson. <coughs> These stories are provided by the General Conference Office of Adventist Mission, which uses Sabbath school mission offerings to spread the gospel worldwide. Read new stories daily at adventistmission.org. Capital A for Adventist and M, capital M for Mission, all one word. Remember, God is always faithful.